Well, hello everybody. My name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans Project here at the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. And uh, it's the 10th of May, 2007, and uh, I have the honor and the pleasure to uh, be with Mr. Jack Craven, who lives in Mount Airy in Cincinnati, an Air Force veteran of World War II, and uh, our, our cameraman, our videographer, and chief of this project here at the History Department of the Public Library is Dennis Daly. And uh, we're going to talk about, uh, with Jack, about his life and his experiences. Jack, where were you born? I was born in Cincinnati, well, really Elmwood Place. Elmwood, Elm, Elmwood Place, gotcha, gotcha. And where'd you go to elementary school? Well, I went to St. Aloysius. Okay. And then after St. Aloysius, I went to Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon. And then I went to night school. I went to OMI for, oh, I guess about five years. Oh, for those who don't know what OMI is, that's the Ohio Military Institute, right? Mechanical. Mechanics Institute. Used to be on the west side. Yeah. And uh, this was to make me a better employee. Then I went to, transferred to UC. Mm -hmm. And at that time, UC would not accept their standards. So I had to start all over. Oh, for heaven's sake. Needless to say, I went to UC at night for maybe three or four years. Of course, then, then it was on the, uh, the GI Bill of Rights. Right. And then I went to, I uh, worked at, uh, I served an apprenticeship at the Stacy Brothers. I was a, a layout man. You had to serve all, your, which was a plus job. You had to, you know, good in math and make patterns and everything. And then I saw that they weren't going to make it. And I said, I'm too young here to waste my life. So I, then I went to AR Industries in St. Bernard, which was, in metals, machining and metals. And then I rose from an assembler over the period of years until I worked there for 40 years until I retired. I retired as a senior vice president. Congratulations. That's a wonderful, wonderful record. But That's it was due to hard work, long hours. Absolutely. I thought nothing of 60 hour weeks all the right. time, even though I was management. Right. Uh, let's go back a little bit now. Uh, when you uh, were at Roger Bacon, now when, what, what period, what years was that? I went that? from 36 to 40. 36 to 40. So you were in the class of 40. Now, one thing I had going against me, well, I can't say going against me, it was I skipped a grade and I was always real interested in athletics and uh, a year ahead of yourself yeah. I was just too small right I understand um, so when when you um, when you finished high school in 40 uh, the war our participation in the war hadn't started yet of course no what were you looking ahead to at that time getting a good job Yes, well, I, I, I had a, what you call a pretty good job at Stacy, Stacy Brothers in St. Bernard. They manufactured uh, like big gas holders and big mm -hmm. gas things. And then, see, I'm very restless. I want to keep moving up. All right. And uh, I wanted to, I saw maybe I was going to be stymied, and that's when I decided to get right. So what, uh, what prompted you uh, uh, to start your military career? Well, it goes back, I guess, to on uh, when the, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I had my first airplane ride that, that Sunday afternoon. It was over at Lincoln. For heaven's sake. <laughs> what kind of a plane was oh, it? One of little puddle jumpers. And, <laughs> and they come back and... Uh, of course, then 
if you weren't in service, you were a, sort of an outcast, I thought. Exactly, exactly. People thought you were, you know, you were a shirking, shirking your duty. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I became very interested in, in joining, and that's when I got interested in the uh, Air Force. And I, I guess it's through the, when you analyze it, through the uh, advertising, you know, the yes. Air Force song. The propaganda, I mean, so Army forth. Air Force song and all that. <laughs> but anyway, I decided that, and, uh, but I didn't, uh, I didn't, couldn't make it through the IT. And the irony of that is, when I got in service, they spent a fortune on my teeth. Really? Yeah. I'll you know. be oh, darned. I got a hold of a, well, I guess I was lucky I got a hold of a guy, a dentist, was very really interested in the, and speaking, <laughs> this is way ahead of it, but it's funny. They made, they had a, they pulled a, a tooth or something, and they made me a denture. <laughs> well, I had a condo in Florida. I used to spend summers and winters down there, and I broke a tooth off. And I took it to a, a, a dentist down there, and they says, how old is that partial? I got to thinking. Well, it had to be in, I'd had to have been in 43. Good heavens. So that's 57. <laughs> and so, that's it's over 60 years old. And she looked at me. She said, we don't have anybody in this building at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And so I had to laugh. And I still have that, that part, so they did a good job on that. I'll be uh, darned. Uh, wh where did you get your first uh, military training? And uh... Well, I was drafted. A draft board was in Norwood. Then we went over to Fort Thomas. And then we did whatever you got, all the shots and all the things, and took the test, and uh, I qualified for OCAS, but uh, they sent us down to Miami Beach, Florida. <laughs> and there again, it sounded like a glamorous spot, but we was on the top floor of the St. Moritz Hotel, <laughs> 60, not allowed to use the elevators. Oh boy. So every up and down and then stuff. So after you, you got your basic training, we had basic training on golf courses down there. Uh -huh. Miami Beach wasn't built up too much. No. This was 42, was it? Uh, early 43. Early I went 43. In late 42. Then, they, uh, just, uh, well, typical of the Army, they sent us to. Mitchell Field, New York. Mm -hmm. We're up there maybe two weeks. <laughs> uh, they sent us back down to Tampa, Florida. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Why they didn't send us? <laughs> we just like to ride the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad. Yeah, right. <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> Gee. Oh. And so then, I was at uh, uh, McDill Field, mm -hmm. Tampa, Florida. Then, at that time, that was a, a B-26 training base. Previous to that, it was a B-17. Well, we used to always say a B-26 a day in Tampa Bay. It was too hot a plane, really. Mm -hmm. Short wing, all too heavy. Well, then they got they established a combat bomb wing for B-26s, and we had the cadre, the TO to fill out. We all were rated high. We got hot, and I, I could have gotten out probably of that outfit because at that time I think you had to have certain amount of stateside service and training before they sent you out. Right. Well, I, you're with to go through all the things with the guys and you have a camaraderie and so I says, I'll stick with it. So they, they, they sent us up to 
Camp Kilmer mm -hmm. in the POE. And then they transferred us over to the Queen Mary, went across, and uh, I, like I have a sketch of where we landed at Scotland because they didn't want to uh, put the Queen Mary in peril of bombing. And they sent us down to the Midlands of England. We got down there and they busted us up. Mm. And I thought, oh, you dumb ass. <laughs> so then they took, made us places, and we went out from there. They brought, sent us out to 303 Bomb Group in Molesworth, England. And we started the uh, 41st Combat Bomb Wing. And the whole reason behind that, I understand, see, they had high regards for the V-26 they were going to start, until they had that one raid to Imogen, a power plant in Holland. And when they sent out 11 planes, one aboard and, t and 10 didn't come back. Goodness sakes. And uh, <clears throat> so they realized that the B-26 was not suited for that type of bombing. How many were a crew on the 26? I would say on a, on a B-26, there was one, two, about six. Six. And the whole story behind it is that the B-26 was doing what it wasn't designed to do, mm -hmm. which happens quite a bit. Yes, of you course. It depended upon the needs of the Air Force, sure. And see, it was better used for tactical goal, not, not for strategic bombing. And so they created more B-17 B bases, and that's what we went into B-17s. Now, we were, being there over there early, we weren't over there as early as the 97th or the 92nd bomb group, but we were there, we, we were over there, say, in May of 43, or May into June 43. Well, they were sending so many over there and starting new bases and they were, see, originally it was only the first air division over there. And they were in the Midlands. Then they started, then the uh, second air division with B-24s and then they had the third air division with B-17s. They were in East Anglia. Now, we were in the Midlands. By the Midlands, I mean like around Northampton, Bedford, and through there. East Anglia was more like over there with uh, Suffolk and Norfolk and all that mm -hmm. over there. Now, Curtis LeMay, he was a, a big guy behind the 305th Bomb Group. And he moved up and they transferred him. He became head of the 3rd Air Division. Now, the 3rd Air Division Really, I think they had uh, 14 bomb groups. The, uh, let's see, 14, 14, and 12. 14 bomb groups, and the B B-24s had 14. And the, and the first air division had 12, or yeah, 12, 14, 14, had 40 bomb groups. Now, they, five, B-24 bomb groups transferred to B-17s, mm. right where they were over there. So the B-24s, had, they had to, they were faster, had a longer range, and carry more bombs, but they weren't the best at the high altitude. And so it got to be a, they like to have a B-17 prevalent, prevalent which mm -hmm. Now, 40 bomb groups, now when you think, people don't realize that I, in research, I delved out that you had 40 bomb groups, and on each bomb group they had to have the facilities for 3,000 personnel. Wow. Now, as I said, they were hewed out of farmlands, and the, uh, 
it, and it took, what an effort it took. Now what good is a B-17 if you don't have fuel and bones? It's nothing. Nothing. And that's what happened to Germany at the end of the war. They had the tanks, but no fuel. Planes, no fuel. Right. But anyway, it, uh, people didn't realize what it took, like transfer, everything had to be transferred over to England. And I brought up in my talks that you've got to use a little math here. The first raid with Tibbetts and them, they had 12 planes. A raid of December the 24th, 1944, they had 2,000. Wow. Now just multiply 2,000 planes by, let's just take 1,800 or 2,000, at least 2,000 gallons of gas. Mm -hmm. On one mission, just think just imagine. what it took for the storage. See, <clears throat> Incredible. what I try to bring out the logistics of what it took, it just, you can have all, everything over there, but if you don't have it with the bombs or the gas or anything there too, it's nothing. That's right, that's exactly right. Well, this is what, of course, this is one of our great strengths because of our mobilization in this yeah. country. Uh, you know, the people who stayed behind to work the factories oh. and the plants and everything. And uh, you, of course, as I and all of us, uh, felt the great spirit of America behind this, this program. Well, I, I have the utmost, utmost regard. And see, when we went over there, like in any war, you don't know what you're going to see. The whole premise was the B-17, the Flying Fortress, as it was nicknamed, had enough protection through guns and stuff that could protect itself. What a fallacy. Oh. Well, no, can't, no, no wonder they call it the Flying Fortress. Well, see, and then <laughs> the irony of it is they thought, well, well, we'll make the YB-40, that's B-17, with more guns and more turrets to fly out on the peripheries to make it more safer. We th originally, we thought that was the answer. No way. Because with the added guns and ammunition, that going out, it could stay up with the B-17s with the load. But once it, the B-17s dropped their bombs, it couldn't keep up. Right. Now, what good is a, a, a B-17 with all the armor out on the periphery against flak? Hmm. See, flak is a... Now, I got information on flak and, and all this it, out of this world. And see, the, when we went over there, the German had the best guns, they had the best tanks, and they had the best planes. There's no denying. Mm -hmm. They had the facilities for the V1, V2, the rocket, the ME163, right. ME26. They were so far ahead of us. And I like to believe that we just overwhelmed them in production. Yes. Exactly right, and that, that is something that, that uh, <clears throat> is very important that you're bringing out because people don't understand. No, I mean, I, I, people I, just I, don't understand this. Uh, see, I got all the, uh, the bombs. See, and your target determine your bomb load. Mm -hmm. You would not bomb submarine pens with incinerators of 500 pounds. Oh, no. Of course not. And you just... Now, like the, the RAF, when I say RAF, that's Royal Air Force. They went out at night. They indiscriminately bombed. It was, uh, and we tried to do precision bombing. And uh, it really, we tried to bomb targets, not whole cities. Yes, right. But it was, uh, your range of bombs that you had to use for different targets is, Phenomenal. Of course, you had to have that all that stored. Now, like your air bases over there, 
you're on an air base and you're isolated, you're out in the middle of the field someplace. You don't know anything going on other than that base. That's right. And we used to think, boy, if we won the war. <laughs> well, when I got to research in this, <laughs> we were one little speck. On, and I gained so much respect for the people that did all the planning and all Yes, that. exactly. Well, this is, this is so important uh, that you're bringing this out for people to understand. And I know that you speak to, to uh, schools and groups and so forth, as I do. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that today is almost incomprehensible. Right. People just don't understand it. And of course, one of the problems is that we're just not teaching history uh, today, or have been for the last three decades, actually. Uh, uh, properly. Uh, Jack, uh, um, what was your, what was your actual duty? My actual duties was intelligence. Intelligence, G2. A2. A2. See, ad group, and wing, wing is, uh, it was A2. Okay. Now, A2, and operations was A3, it just worked hand in glove. Now we, we knew through photo reconnaissance, I did a whole thing on photo reconnaissance. To me, and dwelling on that, you hardly hear anything about it. They had to be the bravest because see, they took the armor, armaments off of a plane and those guys had to rely on their flying ability and speed. Well now that was, that was fine until the Germans come up with the 262. No, the 262 was what? A jet plane. Ah. First jet, twin, twin jet. Is that a Messerschmitt? Pardon? Was that a Messerschmitt? ME-162. Uh, one ME-262. ME See, uh, they had the rocket plane, ME-163. Mm-hmm. Well, that killed about as many of the Germans as it did the, the Anyway, it, that could catch the photo reconnaissance. And so, towards the end, like you always build a better mousetrap, they had to send out P-51s to escort the, escort the uh, photo reconnaissance. Now, the P-38s, are you familiar with P-38s? Oh, yes. You bet. We saw them in the South Pacific. All right. And the, and the ETO, mm -hmm. when I mean ETO, European Theater of Operations. Right. I hope there's people. They didn't work out too well because their turbochargers didn't work at the proper uh, when you're up at 25,000 feet and zero minus 60 degrees and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So what they ended up doing in the now the Pacific, they didn't fly that high, and it, and even the Mediterranean theater they didn't fly. That high. Right, and it was warmer. But what they did, they they took the P38 and made F4s and F5s out of them. By that, they made photo reconnaissance and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. they were using mm -hmm. that. So, um, and then, uh, let me dwell on fighter planes. Even though we were, the, we like to think the P-51 saved the 8th Air Force mm -hmm. with uh, escort all the way. They even go to shuttle raids. I don't know if you realize we had shuttle raids. Did you realize we had shuttle raids from England to Russia? Yes, I've read about that. Well, <coughs> and the P-51s could go all the way with them. Mm -hmm. Well, the shuttle raids didn't prove, like the Russians weren't, they were always so suspicious. Yes, yes. And it just didn't work out. No. Well, the um, uh, in, in, in your A2 uh, activities, yeah. uh, you were to gather information and intelligence through photo, aerial photos. Photo reconnaissance. And uh, look at the pictures. And just like, up at Pinamundi. I don't know if you ever yep. heard of Pinamundi. Sure, up on the North Sea. Yeah, boy. Yep. There was, they were like their right field. Right. 
they would, if they saw through photo reconnaissance, saw a certain type building and burnt grass, they really watched it. Uh huh. Uh, they, and uh, we knew they had special planes before right. that, but that was top secret. Right, know? exactly. But uh, one of my jobs, too, was keeping track of the flak, flak guns. Yeah, tell us, tell us about flak. A lot of people don't understand. They, they see the movies, the old movies, and, and they see the puffs of black in the air, you know. Oh, they, I got pictures that that's it's the most almost black. Terrible stuff. See, they had, they had, see, they used that 88 gun, which they used on the tanks. 88 Terrific millimeter, yep. yep. Then I think they went to 105, but anyway. See, originally, the projectiles wouldn't go up to 25,000, but they worked that out. But they had radar, and they had said it was, that they could fire, uh, let's see, six, six, 18 guns wow. at one time. They'd have a, a group of six here, and a six here, and a six there. And then had a command post there. And uh, oh. it, uh, on some raids, they said they put more shells up in the air than the weight of the bomb dropped. Just imagine. Oh, good heavens. Now, towards the end of, end of the war, when they, they, they bombed all the fuel-making capacities of them, Germany and Romania and all that, they concentrated on flak guns, and they had more flak. And flak, from what I gather, is more of a mental mind than any fighter plane coming at you. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's indiscriminately. Oh, yes. Now they had, they had different flax shells that would, they had a groove so they had bust, you know, just shrapnel, you know, shrapnel come to, yep. it almost tear your leg off. Of Pieces of metal, yeah. And the, uh, it would just tear into the, but then they had some that had like incendiaries on it. As soon as it hit something metal, it burst into flame. flame. Now, when when that flak, uh, when those shells came up, they would go to us. They'd have them timed to go to a certain altitude before they exploded. Yes. Yeah. Timed. And they had it. They had all kind of calculations. They had like a. Zone, I, I wish I had these books. I got them out in the car. <laughs> Here's showing you how they flak worked on it. And I, I, I tell the old pilots, I said, man, if you knew all that, you wouldn't have fly up. You wouldn't would have been up there. <laughs> but uh, flak, I guess, caused the destruction of equal amount of uh, B-17s as, as fighters. Yes. Originally it was fighters, but towards the end it was flak. Yes, right. Um, when, when did you, you got across the channel and you were based? Uh, At Moles for 303rd Bomb Group. Okay, and then you were, uh, you got um, across the channel into France, did you? No, 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 no. You, you were always in? On. At Molesworth. On, on VE Day, you know, after VE Day. Yeah. We got hot, we were supposed to come back to the States. And that's why we went up went up to Greenwich, Scotland, got on the Queen Elizabeth and come back. We were supposed to pick up B-29s and go to the Pacific. Yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, we all, uh, <laughs> we all faced that. I was, I was in the South Pacific and uh, uh, so we were, we were making, making plans to, to be in on the invasion and. Well, the deal of it was, we were, when we come back, we were supposed to get 30 days in the States. Now, see, I hadn't been home since I went in service. Wow. That's a long time. So we, uh, we got home. I never, never got home until after we, we landed in New York and went to Fort Dix and then got home for 30 days. And I said, now, don't send me to Florida. I went, and they sent me back down to Nan, Florida. Uh, back to Florida again. So we were down there 
when they dropped that atomic bomb. Oh yes, August of 19. And we could not comprehend yeah. the destruction of one bomb because you know. Oh yes, sure. We just yeah. couldn't comprehend that. I know, I know. It was just, it was, it was so, so immense and so intense. Well, tell me now, in the meantime, about your family, your parents here at home, and uh, you have siblings? Yes, I have three children. I mean, uh, your brothers and sisters? Oh, yeah. I, both brother, uh, one was in, uh, he was in the Pacific. He was in that big storm coming back after the, one after the war or something. Big typhoon. Yeah. Yeah. And then my other brother, he was in the Korean War. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Are but, they still with you? No, both of them are dead. I'll be darned. Yeah. And I, I'm a Lone Ranger. <laughs> you're a Lone Ranger. Well, I am too. <laughs> well, um, you're, for example, you're 30 days at home before you, they sent you back to Florida. Uh, you were thinking ahead because we, all the propaganda was that we were going to invade Japan. But you know the irony of it is, when we come back on the on Queen Elizabeth, they said you couldn't have any contraband or anything. If you do it, you're going to Leavenworth. And everybody about a, a day out throwing all this stuff overseas, <laughs> all right. off the over. <laughs> 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 and the funny part was, they didn't even quit, uh, do anything, and if we could have got to Queen Elizabeth out of the water, we could have taken it home with us. <laughs> oh, that's a great they, story. They, they just, but they, they, you're going to go to Leavenworth if you have oh, some of this. Oh, oh the fear. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So I know. We, uh, we were home. We don't want to mess up now. <laughs> no, I should say not. Did but, you manage to get any spoils of war uh, home? Any souvenirs? I, I, not, I, I brought a ball glove, uh, uh, <laughs> and you know the irony of it was, of all that, we had, uh, you know, you had so much physical education, uh, physical, over there. Uh, I got hurt playing basketball. For heaven's sake. <laughs> Well, you must have had a tremendous uh, camaraderie in your in your group in your. Boat. Oh yeah, we had a good bunch. That's the reason I stayed with them, you know, because sure. you don't know. Oh, now we get with a bunch of jehus and <laughs> and then we get over, and then you bust you up and. Uh, but anyway, uh, if I'd have got everything, like if I'd have it got to be a. Uh, a pilot or a navigator, I'd probably been more, with my math background, I'd probably been more suitable for a navigator. Probably wouldn't have been here today. Then I put down, I could, I could weld and burn and all that. I put down for different things. I thought. Then overseas, we watched them build air, air bases. And, uh, I had uh, originally on my thing, I had desired service in a uh, Corps of Engineers. Oh. What a mistake that had been. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> those guys, uh, over in England in the rain and fog, working out on those fields, extending runways, which they had to do on every field. Terrible conditions. And they, <laughs> they had worked. 16 hours a day out in that crap. Come back, mud all over, and the highest rank would be a PFC. <laughs> Isn't that, oh my you God. You couldn't, you couldn't get. We got so though, you couldn't have got a promotion if you captured Hitler. For heaven's sake. <laughs> the TOs, the TOs were filled up. Yeah. Because there were so many over there. Did you realize in the 8th Air Force alone, there were 250 to 300,000 people? Good heavens. My goodness, that's People just, just don't, and what, a, this, just the eighth, of course you had the ninth over there, and, and uh, like on a, uh, went up at Control Tower, with all the close proximities of the airfields, trying to get like 40 planes from each base up, you had a certain proximity to, uh, to uh, rendezvous in, and, uh, 
it was almost like, I think there, there could have been over 120, ba oh, more than that, maybe 150 bases, mm -hmm. RAF and that. Right. And so flight control was a big problem. Right, I should say. And those are the ones that things, uh, when I work in a control tower, I got showing you about pass they had to stay in. and uh, Even with that, there were collisions because of the flying conditions over there were bad. Foggy, yes. rainy, low overcast, and the whole concept of flying, training here in the States, they flew in good weather states. Right, right. So they got over there, and they, uh, it was altogether different. Isn't that something? You know, that's something that a lot of us never thought about. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, out in the South Pacific, uh, except for rare occasions when there'd be a tremendous storm, but generally the, the flying conditions were, were pretty open, and, uh, but I, I, I understand that, and Northern Europe was just, huh. the, the climate was just terrible. When we came back, we were so used to the weather over there, come back, we took about six hours that day, we couldn't get uh, <laughs> cool off. Isn't that something? Yeah, well that, um, you, can, you, uh, can you think of any humorous uh, occasion, uh, something that sticks out in your mind uh, that uh, people who will see this would like to hear about? Well, we as uh, people, uh, I mean like my, my job, that actually didn't fly, we flew a lot of times when pilots that had their missions in, they wanted to stay on flight pay. Hey, you want to fly today? We get their time in, yeah. yeah. They get their time in. Keep your skins up. <laughs> <laughs> you know that? And we'd fly. To, and now, you know, we had uh, things other people don't realize that they had uh, two base air depots. And the uh, they had, they had to have, one had B-17s. They had 25,000 people there and the other one had 15,000 people. Good heavens, oh my goodness. But see, you had to adopt planes for different reasons. Like you make a B-17. In England, it had to have a lot different armor and different stuff than it did down in India. Yes. So, and then uh, uh, they had to go a lot with PFF bombing. I don't know if you know path one. Bombing with radar through clouds. Okay. See, if, if, if you had looked for visual bombings, you could only bomb maybe three or four times a month. Oh, for so they had to go with radar. Yes. Bombing down. Yes. By radar, they'd send over, over planes to take pictures and then the, that uh, with scopes, then they take pictures of the scopes, and then so then they go out and PFF planes would drop, and then they drop on the bottom, right through the clouds. Right. You know, I, I can remember reading about when I was in the South Pacific and, and reading the Stars and Stripes or Yank, uh, yeah, you got it. different things that we got uh, for information and uh, but reading about uh, bombing the uh, the factories uh, the german factories um, where the ball bearings were made you know Schweinfurt. stuttgart and schweinfurt great schweinfurt raids i can remember reading about those well now see i'm a tactician on that we had 15 raids, now mind you, 15 raids where we lost 40 or more planes. Oh my goodness. Good. Now, heads. that's 600 figure, 10, planes. 10 living in a plane. Wow. And they're all highly trained. Yes. It isn't like, you know, they take a year or two to train them, see? No. But just think, and Swineford, they lost 60. The most they lost was 69. Good. And uh, they lost out on a raid to Berlin. Is that so? But just think, 15 raids. 
Now, can you imagine what the press would say today? Oh, yes. Ah. <laughs> well, see, Cronkite and uh, <laughs> he was a war correspondent over there. Yeah. And uh, the guy on 60 Minutes, um, he's, but I think they. Wallace. Pardon? Oh, that, uh, he's right on the end, oh, it's at the end of 60 Oh, oh I know who you mean, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, uh, a, a very sarcastic, uh, yeah, yeah, humorous yeah, guy. Yeah. yeah, I know who you mean. <laughs> they, they didn't. Uh, uh, now, if that had, they had to send, uh, they had to send, send them boys home. And I said, yeah, and you'd be speaking German today. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Oh. And and that's that's what people don't understand today. And and of course, you know. To lose one life is, is terrible. To lose 3,000, like 9-11 here in this country, you know, terrible. But comparing to the period of time and the loss of life, this, uh, what we've suffered so far in the Middle East is, is peanuts in comparison to but that, it's a that war. Um, now, did you, did you do any photographing yourself? No. No. Okay. I, uh, uh, see, what we try to do is at a certain height, the range of the flat guns. Well, those Germans they were smart. You see, instead of stationary, they had a lot of stationary guns. They had railroad guns too. Moving oh, yes. them around. They move them around. And you bet. And <laughs> they were quite, uh, the more I delved into it, they were, uh, they were very, very smart. Well, of course, the Germans have always been very technologically advanced and very scientifically oh, trained gee. and so forth. Tell me about, did you ever have any experience with the Krupp works, the great guns? Well, see, the Krupp works, they were in the Ruhr. They were in the Ruhr Valley, that's they, right. That uh, was Happy Valley. They, <laughs> they were so surrounded with flat guns. Was, uh, see, and they even, we even tried put bombs on the outside of B-17 with wooden wings, and so you'd stay outside of the range and release them, let them glide in, but that didn't aid them. Pretty hard they to They tried do. everything to, yes, yes. to stay out of there. Yes. But it was just like, build a better mouse trap every And you know the one, the Germans, we're making as many fighter planes at the end of the war as they burned because they went underground. They went underground. Well, this, that brings up a good point, Jack. And you know, people, uh, people rant and rave about, uh, you know, civilian deaths and so forth. And you talk about uh, uh, the great Dresden raid, of yeah. course. Uh, uh, what people don't realize here is just what you're saying. They had their factories underground, yeah. and they'd put them underneath a cathedral, or they'd put them underneath a hospital. People did, our people. They put them around PW camps, see, that was deep. Yeah, right, right. Did you have any friends that uh, were shot down and were captured? Oh, yeah. And uh, went into Stalags and so forth? Yes, yeah. uh, had yeah. a lot of good. Uh, the, here's another fact that people don't realize. The North Sea, at the closest points down about Calais is only about, what, 30 miles? Right. Up above must be 150. We had 450 bombers that had ditched into the North Sea. Uh -huh. Your rate of survival on a B-17 is 30, about 38 percent. Good heavens. On a B-24, it's about 26%. Good grief. Because it, it seemed like the B-24, the, the bomb bay doors weren't. And 450 crashes in there. And I went back to our base after 50 years. It was not operating as a bomber field. In fact, we couldn't, it was operating as a, then as a missile base. First time I was over there, we couldn't go in. That due to the SALT agreement with Russia, they took the missiles out, but they showed them 
And they let us go through the, the, ba the base with them. And uh, it, what our old base is now, or was, it's an intelligence gathering system for all of Europe. Really? And I talked to the colonel over there. <laughs> I said, whenever you move out of here, don't tear down everything like you did ours. And I said, I don't trust them Russians. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> might need it again. <laughs> I had a little more info, I'd better not talk. I'm sure you did. <laughs> and he says, don't worry, we're watching. Wow, well, yes. But they had the, our old base, it was the, they've flown reconnaissance and all yes, that. Yes, yes. Now, you know, we still have, um, I don't know how many uh, bases over there in England. Yes, I don't know about that either. I, yeah. I, I don't know. Because, see, we went to the cemetery there, and the, uh, they had a flyover from RAF Lakenheath, which is up the line. And uh, I think they still have uh, maybe some at Alkenbury. Mm -hmm. See, I got every base over there I know, and just all, everything about that. So I, I'm. How many times you've been back since uh, the war? Uh, we went back uh, officially to the base once. Ah. We went over there one time. We couldn't get out because they had protesters out there. Oh dear. Because that's when it was a. Missile base. Yes, yes. They wouldn't let so us you were you were there during the when the Cold War was on. In other so words, so it, it was. Uh, yes, I should say. And I am a firm. <clears throat> see, my whole, just like I said in that, my whole thing is to educate people on what went on and what it took to win the war. Yes. And behind the scenes, I'm I'm looking more. Sure, the pilots deserve every credit they can get. But there were so many other outfits like oh yes, like the carpet beggars dropping those guys. They went out every night, dropping supplies and uh, guns and yes. ammunition, anything over occupied Europe. Yes, and every kind of weather. I got every mission they flew, and I, yeah, those guys. Uh, Did you have any connection with the uh, uh, with the French underground or? Well, see. That's what you. That's what you did. Yeah. The Marquis. Sure. Uh, and they even dropped agents. And do you know that we had planes set up that a guy on the ground threw a code. They could fly low and pick up just what he transferred. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them times they it was shot down too. It was a cat and mouse really. Oh yes. Well, you know that's uh, and that's a problem. In the philosophy of today, uh, we're 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 putting down, we're denigrating uh, the spy idea, the espionage, and how important it is. We've got to know that information today as well as in those days. Well, I can remember the day we got on the field. They said, "Now, do not walk across any kind of this field." Because, and that night, the Germans uh, welcomed us to the theater. They had, to, they, they had to have spies on those fields. Of course, of course. Um, how are we doing? Plenty of time? Good. We're cruising right along here with Jack Craven. <laughs> and we're having a but, wonderful time well, hearing. Well, the deal of it is. <laughs> As I said, I had 25 years of research, and I'm finding out the unsung heroes is, is something else. And yes. That's, my whole thing is to, to promote the young people that what went on, what it took to win, it took everybody back home, uh, cooperation all the way down the line. And yes. Well, that is no so. No bickering, you got to do it. You had a job to do, get in there, and you didn't worry. You know, we never thought of getting home because we're all in the same boat. Absolutely. And you knew you had a job to yeah. do. Of course. Of course. And, and another thing that blows people away today is uh, how much you were paid. <laughs> <laughs> Your monthly pay. <laughs> Just pitiful. Oh, it, was. it was a pittance. <laughs> but you know, 
uh, one thing, uh, you know, we could buy cigarettes overseas for five, dollars, five cents a pack. Right. And I didn't smoke, and I sent him home to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had more cigarettes in the drugstore. Uh, I should say, well, those days were really something uh, here, here at home with uh, gas rationing and, uh, you know, three gallons a week with, your, with the A sticker that you put in your window and all that sort of thing. Yeah, let me relate a deal that we had. Generally, in our jobs, we worked See, to prepare for a mission, you got teletype messages in, and you had scramble phones. And all that. You worked the night before because everything had to be figured out, rendezvous and everything. Of course, that was done by generals and colonels and all that. Of course. But we'd have to, the bases over there, we had fog. Do you know we'd get lost on our own base? Really? Lost. <laughs> and uh, see, they had the airplanes, you had your runways, your main run and your two intersect. And you had flower pots where they parked off, so they didn't want the planes all lined up, so yes. to speak. And you'd walk along this seaman and you'd walk on, and then you look up and there's a plane. And oh, we're not there. <laughs> we were walking out, we said, we'll, we'll never find a way. But sound carries. Yes. We'll listen to a sound and walk towards that sound. How about that? But you just couldn't, you couldn't believe how foggy it'd be. Just imagine. Well, Jack, it's just, uh, it's just a, a true uh, honor for us to hear your experiences. And uh, now that you're going to be on DVD and uh, you'll get a, you and your family will get a copy of this uh, uh, interview and a copy goes to the Library of Congress to the archives in Washington and one stays here in the public library so uh, you're you're in history for forever now <laughs> but you and, know the funny part I had all the paperwork to sign I said I said I need a lawyer to sign all these papers <laughs> <laughs> well we're just uh, truly honored to to uh, have you here and uh, thank you and wish you well I uh, hope to see you up at the uh, Air Force Museum, oh, yeah. and uh, God bless you, and uh, uh, anything else, a quick shot that you want to offer? Well, as I says, uh, my whole thing is to bring out what went on, yep. and uh, it seems like there's so much against this Iraq war, but We'd almost have to do the same thing again and get everybody get behind it. Absolutely, that's exactly right. And, it, and quitting, are, quitting over there now, I think, would be the worst thing they could oh, do. Oh, it would be terrible. It would be terrible. Yes, we can't, we can't allow that, and you know, God bless our country and everything. We're hopeful that, uh, that this will be uh, resolved and uh, as quick as possible. Um, we've been talking to Jack Craven, uh, U.S. Air Force, uh, veteran of World War II who has given us so many insights into what went on at that time. And Jack, we want to thank you for that and uh, good luck to you and keep them flying. <laughs> <laughs>